All right. Our next speaker is uh, Alan Hartless. Uh, Alan um, has been with Maori for many years now. Uh, so anybody familiar with Maori definitely know Alan. And uh, so he uh, will uh, basically uh, talk to us about uh, lessons learned uh, from the infamous Maori theory and uh, the revolutionary code journey ahead. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Alan. Yeah, thank you, Rowan. Um, yes. it's, it's exciting to be here. Thanks everyone for, for joining uh, my session. Uh, for those who don't know me, as Rowan said, I'm Alan Hartless. Um, actually, I, I, I live in Houston, Texas with my two kiddos, uh, my husband and two fur children who pretty much own our apartment. Um, you might actually see them running around. I see one back there since I can't do a virtual background. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they won't be too distracting as they're running around. They uh, they own the place and allow us to live here as long as we serve them. So that's that's how the cats are, right? So anyway, so, um, you know, I met DB, the founder of Modic, many years ago through working on websites and hacking on code. And, and back in late 2013, he invited me, uh, my family over for dinner and to propose embarking on this grand new adventure. Um, and it was there that he gave me the first pitch for Modic. I might get a little in trouble pulling this out of my personal archives, uh, but this was the original branding that he pitched it with. And uh, he wanted to bring the first open source marketing automation solution uh, to everyone. And, and at the time, only the big guys could afford the existing proprietary solutions, right? But, but we wanted something uh, for the small and mid-sized businesses. We wanted to make it easy as if you could install if you can install a CMS on a web server, you can install a marketing automation application and be ready in no time to, to engage with your customers. Obviously you sold me and so I joined as number three in 2014 um, in March and, and when I wrote the first lines of the code. Um, exactly 365 days later, we released Modic 1.0, obviously with much better branding. Um, it's been an incredible journey. I've met and worked with some amazing people from all around the world. Um, I've learned so much along the way. It's, it's exciting to see the community and the project grow and mature and to finally have the first ever Modicon, which has been talked about for a very long time. Um, I hope you all have had a great time. And, and as we're getting uh, wrapping up to a close, you found a way to, to engage in the community um, in addition to just finding additional tools for your marketing tool belt. Uh, as, the, as the theme of the conference implies, we have an incredible adventure ahead of us, and so it's exciting to, to jump into that. Um, so anyway, y'all y'all came here to hear something different. Um, so I, I say some of this because I've been around for a while. <laughs> There's no fair amount of the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, in our code, and, and using some of that knowledge and experience to advocate for the proposal uh, brought forth by Ruth during the keynote. Um, I, I do want to pause and apologize if I look a little unkept. I, I try to participate in the No Shave November every year in honor of my and your loved ones. Um, we're lost to cancer and to celebrate those who had overcome it. So I recommend check out the movie if you don't know about it. Okay, anyway, so we're here. So lessons learned from the infamous Modic 3 and the revolutionary code journey ahead. Um, you're here because you want to hear about that or probably more importantly, the journey ahead. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, um, if not, or, but if there are good, just jot them down. You'll have a chance at the end to, to ask those. And I definitely encourage them. Um, so Modic 3. This is my sad attempt at making a visualization of an echo to emphasize the number three. Uh, discussions on Modic 3 or M3 as it became codenamed started in early 2018. Modic Inc. was uh, seeing some of its largest customers at the time, uh, but the code and schema we found quickly <laughs> struggled to scale on its own. The reality is Modic wasn't written with scale in mind. It was written with a GoDaddy $5 a month hosting server in mind. It was written with small data um, it was written for small businesses and, and sending out the occasional newsletter. We didn't think big enough from the beginning. And by the time we needed to, to support big, it's, it was a little too late. We've obviously done a lot to, to scale uh, to what we have today. We've done, um, it, and there are additional things we can do, um, but it will only take us so far. And, and unfortunately, it's not far enough. Um, in hindsight, we should have built with enterprise in mind so that the small businesses would have reaped all the benefits uh, from that as well as they grew and as their data grew with them. Um, so it, it was recognized then back in 2008 when we started talking about Modic 3 that we needed something revolutionary. We, we knew that to meet the needs of large businesses, 
um, in enterprises, in addition to the small mom and pop shops, we needed a new data layer that could scale. We needed a powerful, well-written API that anyone could hook their systems into with ease, or even write their own front-end applications to it. Um, we, we need a background job concurrency right? um, built in to avoid the incredible slow cron jobs that kind of build segments one at a time, build campaigns one at a time, execute the campaigns one at a time, uh, send your emails one at a time, and then if they don't time it just right, it could be an hour process to get through the whole thing from start to finish, right? So, so a lot of talk, a lot of collaborative documents started happening, um, but, but then it went nowhere, right? The things, the things that needed to be done were all the right things, uh, the kickoffs, the work groups, the documents, all the planning that went into that, they were all the right things. But the question was, why did it not go anywhere? Okay. And, and I think it was the right things to do, but it was just the wrong time to do it. Um, I'm gonna circle back around to why I think they were the right things. I'm gonna just kind of focus just a few minutes on why it was the wrong timing. Um, at the time, Modic Inc. was quickly growing and needed all their devs on, on deck to support its own customers in both number and scale. Uh, Modic Inc.'s dev team was small. The community dev team and those who were participating at the time were, were small. Um, but you know, together, we, we had a number of really talented people, but none available to dedicate specifically to the vision of Modic 3, um, to see that get over to the finish line. So what happened is that the work fizzled, right? But the expectation and the hope remained on this Modic 3 uh, being the next big thing. And, and on, and in hindsight, what I think is we got so caught up on the number three so that we, we wouldn't break semantic versioning that it blocked us from being able to move forward with anything else. You know, there are thoughts around we should we should bump our minimum version of PHP so we could use some really cool new PHP features. No, no, we can't do that. We gotta wait till Modic 3. We need to make these BC breaks in order to make our product better. No, 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 it has to wait till Modic 3. We need to upgrade SwiftMailer to their latest major version to support UTF actor to UTF characters now allowed in email addresses. No can do, Modic 3. Right, so so we, we got caught up on this Modic 3. And, and then um, we, we weren't allowing ourselves to do anything that would break that semantic versioning, semantic versioning. And then the classic happened. We ran out of time. <laughs> Symphony 2 is at the end of its life with even security fixes. Um, and, and we didn't have time to do anything we planned originally for Modic 3 other than just upgrade those dependencies. Um, we did not foresee the amount of work or the time that it would take to do that. Um, it wasn't because we were designing cool new features or refactoring code because we thought it would make the product better. Um, it was just all just to, to get through the technical debt and just to upgrade those, those core dependencies. Um, code written on Symphony 2.5 and Modic 1, still released in 2014, um, still permeated the code base. Dependencies were significantly out of date, requiring many changes to support the newer versions. Uh, to upgrade Symphony meant upgrading half a dozen other major vendors, which, which meant decent sized refactorings. Making one change, as Ruth alluded to during the keynote, making one change broke something else. Fixing that broke something, uh, the original issue. Fixing the original issue again broke something else because there's code depending upon code that was depending on code that had three different purposes. Um, it, just, it just caused these ridiculous complexities. And obviously, we, we don't we, we don't have the test coverage that we should. Um, that was a, a tech date tech debt we chose to take on in the name of getting to market quicker. Um, and as a result of that, we we weren't able to catch these bugs or things that we broke. And we hit multiple roadblocks along the way um, because we just it was a black box to know what we were really getting into as we were moving from years of build, building on Symphony two into Symphony three. Um, and, and in some ways we had to introduce some hacky workarounds just to make it work. It wasn't fun. And to be honest, it was, it was a bit of a nightmare. And, and so, but that, you know, that's kind of where some of the code is right now. And that's the journey, just upgrading to Symphony 3, expected to be somewhat straightforward, turned out to be a huge endeavor. There are a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, just either, from Modic 3 or just from the years that we've spent growing. And the first one is think big and plan accordingly. We didn't, we didn't write code in 2014 with our, our biggest businesses in mind. We, we wrote code with the smallest ones in mind and, and have counter challenges to scale every step of growth. Uh, we find ways to make it happen because we have to, right? And we prop it up with whatever services or external means or wiping out data or trying to do or different integrations and things to make it work, but it can't stand on its own. 
And, and again, we can only go so far with that, but not far enough. Make sure the plan is set up for success. This seems like a no-brainer, right? But but with Modic 3, we really didn't do that because with, with the original plans, um, because we didn't have the dedicated resources uh, to execute on it. And so it was set up for failure. Other thing I took away from the Modic 3 thing is don't let semantic versioning block your progress. And we got so caught up on this Modic 3 number that we, we weren't willing to go to a Modic 4, to a Modic 5, or whatever it would take. And so, and then it just kept building up and building up, getting pushed off until we finally got to the end where we had no choice because we were running out of time for the security fixes um, to just do the, the minimum uh, requirements. And then there's the classic technical debt always comes at a premium, right? It's a classic scenario, balancing go-to-market time and writing code with best practice in mind and, and covered in tests. Uh, we'll always have to seek that and find that balance. But if we lean too far towards saving time, the time will definitely be lost later, as we found in Modic 3. Um, and as we will find as we continue to push into the future with the current code base, that um, you, know, you, you pay for it later, and especially when you're you're dealing with debugging and, and dealing with bug after bug as a result of those code changes. There's a lot of, so those, those are my lessons learned from Modic 3 and from before. Um, but I do just want to pause and reflect and celebrate because there's, there's quite a bit of negative there. But, you know, it's I'm very proud of Modic. I, I'm very proud of where it is today and everyone who has contributed to its story. I'm very proud of the community. Um, there are a lot of people who love it, contributed to it, um, are doing incredible things with it. And, and I'm thankful for all of them and what they've done uh, for the project and, and their experiences. And, and I look forward to where together we will take this project tomorrow. Um, but, I'm, but I'm not one to shy away from admitting fault or calling out things that we could have done better as we learn together. Um, as I say, hindsight is always 2020. Right? So there, there's a lot that we could do different. There's a lot that we would do different um, if we knew then what we know now. But obviously, it was through these experiences that we know it now. And so we have this incredible opportunity ahead of us to apply them as we seek to make Modic even better. Um, and that's why I want to talk a little bit now why I think the M3 plan, the original M3 plan, um, was the right one. As I said, we were planning Modic in 2014. We weren't thinking big enough. Um, we created a foundation that doesn't easily support the scale and flexibility that we needed to today. Even small businesses can have huge data needs. And the very foundation of uh, Modic's existing code base makes that quite challenging for us. The concept of the cracked house uh, in Ruth's keynote is spot on. We, we can continue to patch and fix and repaint and do whatever is necessary to, to make it scale to what we want it to scale to. Um, and just squeeze every little bit out of it that we can. But that doesn't increase the foundation's ability to support more. And at some point, we're going to max out. And so we need to build, and as we're looking to the future, we want to build a skyscraper uh, on a foundation designed for a two-story home. And, and that's just not going to cut it. So as we look at this you know, an enterprise foundation, it, it needs a scalable and flexible data layer. Um, we need a powerful API-driven core we need um, a scalable background task manager, and we need a modern and easy to use user experience. Modic has these to some extent, right? But they're, but they're faulty and designed with, again, small in mind. So to support big, uh, again, requires creative implementations, hacks, third-party services to prop it up and work around uh, for the limitations. Namely, the, the data layer is currently fully dependent on doctrine. Um, and it, in itself, we have kind of worked in some hacks, work around the ORM nature, for example, with custom fields for leads. Um, Doctrine natively doesn't support dynamic fields defined, so we have a lot of hack, hacks and workarounds to make that work. Um, the, the schema itself is not optimized for a lot larger data. I can't easily leverage the power of other database technologies. Um, and although Doctrine has this concept of drivers that we could write support in um, or leverage what they have today, it's, it's very fixed to an SQL, right? code to SQL type conversion. Um, and it doesn't leverage things like um, CDP APIs. It's just not easy to implement that. And when we look at Modix API, it's very PHP centric and not written to any accepted specification, which, it, <laughs> sorry, can't talk, which makes it difficult to integrate for enterprises and other languages. Um, the core is not written API first, which you know, we're fixed to the PHP hard coded templates. And, and of course, we know all about the cron jobs, right? So it leads to the, to the hard question. Um, if our foundation can't really support natively what we needed to support without a lot of outside help, 
And if our code has significant tech debt and inherent risk to refactor, taking into account all I said about Modic 3, and we have to rewrite a front end anyway before we get to upgrade to Symphony 5 because Symphony 5 is removing PHP template support. And how do we move forward? Do we evolve or do we revolutionize? Can we evolve from what we have today? Um, there are many, many great articles out there uh, on the pros and cons, along with successes and failures of companies going down each of these paths and why. And I realize there, there will be a lot of discussions. There will be a lot of, uh, there's high stakes on both sides. And there's a lot of points of views and, and personal experiences with, with these two. Um, but ultimately, we have to decide what's best for the, the project as we move forward into our future. Um, and we want to be able to get there in a timely manner so that once we arrive, we're not already behind the times yet again. So that's why I'm advocating for a revolution. Um, all of those things I mentioned in the previous slides are glued together today with monolithic interdependent, uh, <laughs> um, interdependent code. Um, we, we could try to evolve it. We could try to start refactoring feature by feature to be API first with a React front end. We could start writing into core support for message bus to queue and, and process background jobs without having to run a cron job for a task. You know, we, we could spend months re refactoring all of our PHP templates to Twig to support 75. But the reality is we'd only be repainting. We, we'd maybe tear down some new some walls, rebuild some walls, but the foundation stays the same. Uh, and that's where we really need to grow to support these enterprise levels. Um, since Doctrine currently serves as a data layer, it permeates nearly everything uh, throughout the application. But, but we need to pull, replace Doctrine or place something in between it as an abstracted layer so that we can leverage third-party CDP for contacts or, or eventing history, you know, technologies that better support this, these type of big data. But at the same time, still support a MySQL. We still want to be able to install it on those servers that you can run a CMS on and, and be able to do your marketing needs. Right? So we want to be able to support both sides. Um, so we could spend years repainting, rebuilding, doing all that stuff and inevitably find ourselves blocked from growing because our foundation gets, just can't support it. Or we could build a new foundation that's capable of supporting a skyscraper or one bedroom house while we continue to redecorate our current house and do the necessary repairs in the meantime. Um, in the end, we'll, we'll end where we want to be, where we need to be in a much quicker time frame. So what about Modic 3? <laughs> All that stuff you said about Modic 3 and the revolution, you know, we've been there, we've done that. We've, we've tried this before and, and it fell flat. So wouldn't it be the same here? So that's why I said, I think it was the right thing to do, but it was the wrong time. Uh, you know, now with Aqua's acquisition of Modic, the growth of the community developers, the organization of the community under Ruth's leadership, the doubled R&D team at Aqua being ramped up so that we can devote people solely to this project. Uh, we're now in a good place to finally take on the M3 vision. Uh, and by, but this time, we're not holding up progress because of a number, Modic 3. We will have a Modic 4 with new features. We may we may, may very well have a Modic 5 or a Modic 6. But in the end, we'll also have an enterprise ready, open source marketing automation solution that was built from the ground up to support companies of all shapes and sizes uh, that won't only be a joy to use, but also to develop. So what should this new foundation be built on? Um, Ruth gave, a, gave um, some early insights during her keynote. You know, one of the things we're looking at is the API platform. The API platform is a framework seamlessly integrated into Symfony framework that provides us the interfaces necessary for writing custom data persisters and data providers um, that adds that abstraction between the application and the data layers that we can support a MySQL database. Uh, via Doctrine, or we could we could write custom persisters and providers to support a CDP API uh, to drive Modic's data. You know, we still have the Symphony framework to power plugins and integrations as we do today. Uh, we could also port over many of our existing entities as they exist, like landing pages, forms, emails, minimizing some of these schema changes. And, and API platform will just pick those up and, and power them. So with with API platform and Symphony, we still have a lot of what we're already familiar with be able to accelerate development. It also provides API first core with support for GraphQL and, and other specifications like REST um, that we, if we chose, we, we could implement those, those different uh, formats. And another cool thing is it has native support for Symphony Messenger. 
Uh, so for example, today we have the Q bundle you know, that handles kind of proxying email tracking requests or page hits into some third party. Well, with, with API platform and Symphony Messenger, it's it's super easy to implement. Uh, Symphony Messenger also kind of give us the, the foundation and the framework to have a scalable um, background jobs or worker queue, rather than having that single cron job to build segments and build campaigns, and send emails and all that. So whether you want to implement a message bus with Redis or RabbitMQ, or if you just want to use a MySQL database, uh, it supports them all out of the box. So you don't necessarily need to introduce new text, um, but you will be able to scale these workers, these consumers to, to process against um, all of these jobs uh, concurrently and you can scale up and down. You know, if you if you have a just a normal hosting, just run multiple cron jobs to process these queues. If you have a VPS, then you can use something like Supervisor D to scale up as big as as you need to work through your your task queue. Um, so we want to build the scale uh, both from a database layer and from um, an API and from uh, a worker queue into the core of the product so that we're not having to prop it up and have all this extra stuff just to make it scale. I realize I can't get through all this. And then ultimately we would have the, the React front end. All of this would support kind of a modern front end application that um, you can use it, but if you're an enterprise and you really want something different, uh, these, these APIs would provide you that. Just to look at a little bit closer, some of the market texture, just kind of look at the diagrams. You know, overall, this is what we're looking at where we'd have a, a React front end with the various components uh, that pull in your contact user experience, your campaign user experience, uh, forms, um, and all of these communicate with the back end that's API first. So, skinny controllers, um, API platform provides all of this for us, taking our entity definitions and, and being able to um, communicate those to the front end app. Of course, we'll have our core application with all of its services and our plugins, and then sitting on that data management service provided by API platform through its interfaces, um, which would allow us to, by default, support MySQL, but then again, have these third-party options um, if we if we want to write support into CDPs. Um, and then having your message bus, whatever technology you choose, and, and your consumers and workers that will work against that. Looking a little closer into our API platform backend, you know, we'll, we'll have that GraphQL content negotiation at the top. And then in the core of the application, you have your entity definitions. A API platform provides um, decorated services, which will give us opportunities to inject into its processing so that we can dispatch, for example, our, our pre and post save events that we allow plugins to hook into. Um, we can we can do all kinds of stuff around that, right? And then, of course, you have your security ULM, the configuration, your plugins, all of, all of that stuff we have today. Um, but then what's new is, again, those data providers and data persisters that gives us that abstracted layer to be able to communicate to multiple database layers. Um, and then just one last slide would be to look a little closer at that data layer. And this is where, by default, your data provider, for example, would say your, your eventing history or your profiles you know, they, they will be read from, um, by default, the core ones, which we'll have in the, the core product that will read from MySQL. But then we would be able to use um, these custom ones using priorities set in the code to, to maybe use um, a CDP API to read, read those um, or to be able to write to them uh, using the data persister side. And then API platform provides all that's needed to be able to, um, to take like pagination and filtering and these different things and via interfaces. And then we would write in the proper communication channels with the underlying technology. So what are, what are the next steps? Um, as Ruth mentioned during her keynote, there would be an opportunity to join these newly formed working groups and, and tiger groups. And, um, and so there's lots of opportunities on Slack as it is today to get started on these. I expect there'll be a lot of uh, discussions, just kind of re fine tuning and refining these things. None, none of what I presented today um, in terms of the exact implementation is in stone. So we'll have lots of discussions to, to kind of harden that and um, maybe even have some other ideas. But the important thing is that, you know, we're gonna do it together and, and we could take all the experiences that we've learned along the way with, with Modic as it is today, apply them and, and make Modic even better and take Modic to that infinity and beyond. So that's all I've got. Um, 
again, thank you. But if you have any questions, we'll we'll start taking those now. Rowan, I need um, some help kind of guiding that because I'm not sure how to communicate the questions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, well, thank you, Alan, for uh, all the lesson learned. <laughs> um, yes, let me see. So we have a first question from Flo. Uh, mm -hmm. So he said, uh, uh, hi, Alan, uh, thanks for your awesome presentation. Uh, but do you yeah. think uh, that Maoric 4 uh, should be based on Symphony 5? So the, the challenge there, we're blocked with, with Symphony 5 right now because Symphony 5 removed the uh, support for PHP templates. Um, so it'd be great if we could jump straight to Symphony 5. The problem there is that we would have to rewrite all of our PHP templates as they are today to Twig uh, to support that. Um, and so as we're looking into this next generation, um, you know, that, that would just be a lot of work that we'd go into that, that we could put into rewriting our, our, our complete new front end for, for next generation. Um, and as Ruth alluded to, if, if there are businesses or entities super interested in that particular thing and want to put in that effort, um, that could definitely add some life to Modic as it is today. Okay. Yeah, do we have any more questions? Let me check. Um, yeah, sometimes it takes a little, a little bit for the questions to okay. pop up. We're not beating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Slack. If uh, if any questions come up, of course, I encourage everyone to, if you're really interested in this, join the, the working groups. Um, uh, if, yes, if you have an opinion, then we want to hear it. So please join and, and participate. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan, for the presentation. And uh, we'll see you around. That sounds good. Thank uh, you, everyone. Yeah, no problem. Right. Bye. Yeah.